Well, hello again, everyone. Um, had a lot of um, requests about more cruise ship stories. I was kind of running out of stuff to say. I think I've told you um, many of the funny stuff that happened to me. Uh, I had one story, and I'm not going to tell you what happened. We'll kind of let it unfold as it goes along. I was uh, on the Carnival Conquest for uh, like three contracts, like about a year and a half, six months each. And it was one of my favorite ships. Really enjoyed working on that ship. We were sailing out of New Orleans. At the time, the Carnival Conquest was the biggest uh, Carnival ship in the fleet. Had my um, associate, Mario, kind of like my um, right-hand man. He was from Uruguay, spoke several languages. We were a team. And we were doing really well on that ship. I was art director working for uh, Park West Gallery. On that ship, when I took it over, the average sales were about 16,000 per week in, in art auctions, in, in art. Uh, my average on that ship was $180,000. I did a million dollars in one hour, one time. I sold a suite of Salvador Dali's, full signature Salvador Dali for $750,000 in auction on a carnival ship on the Conquest. And so things are going really well. It was like my second contract. We had been there like two weeks. And things are really rolling along really well. Um, I was in my cabin. I'd been scuba diving a couple, week, couple days before. Uh, went down, you know, pretty deep. About, you know, 90 feet. I forget where I was going, what I was looking at. But anyway, went diving. And I'm not selling it to say I don't know if this had anything to do with anything or not, but it was just, you know, one of the factors. Anyway, a couple days later, I'm in my cabin, had a nice guest cabin, and I started, uh, I wasn't sleeping well. I just um, was feeling all sweaty and stuff and hot, and been that way for like a day or so. But this particular day, it was early, it was like, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock on turnaround day. That's the day the cruise starts. And we were sailing out of New Orleans. And that was our home port. If you've ever sailed out of New Orleans, you know that when you leave New Orleans, you don't just go right into the ocean. It's like four hours of sailing down the Mississippi to get to the open sea. And so we had sailed about an hour before. And you're going very slow down the, down, down the Mississippi. I'm in my cabin. And I'm just, you know, sweating. I don't know why I'm sweating. It wasn't hot. And my shoulder starts hurting really bad. So uh, I, I was friends with the doctor and the nurse on board. They were all friends of mine. We used to have dinner together and everything. And I just called down there and uh, got the nurse on the phone. Um, she just happened to answer the phone. Normally she wouldn't even be there. She'd be on call. Like the, the hospital was actually closed. It's like six or seven at night, if I remember right. So I told her, I said, yeah, I don't know what's wrong. I feel sweaty and my shoulder hurts. And she said, come on down. I'm going to take a look at you. And the hospital was literally one deck below my cabin, right around the corner. It was like right there. So I went down there and she took one look at me and brought me in there. And then some lady with seasickness or something, she gave her some tablets and sent her on her way. They brought me in there and she called the doctor. And you don't usually call the doctor unless it's something serious because he was, you know, he was off duty. So he came down, he's a young guy, I cannot remember his name. This is quite a while ago, like early 2000s. Um, doctor came down, started asking all these questions. It's Mark, have you done any drugs or anything? No, I haven't done any drugs. Um, and he says, uh, we want to give an EKG just to see what's going on here. So I take my shirt off, EKG, they're putting all these electrodes all over your body. I'm the only one in the hospital, just me, the nurse, who turned out she was a cardiac nurse, by the way, I forgot to mention that. And they, uh, they do all that, and he says, uh, you're having a heart attack. And he gives me um, nitroglycerin and something else. Um, I said, how can I be having a heart attack? I said, he said, well, you know, I, mean, I was in really good health back then. Like, never smoked, hardly drank, went to the gym like every other day. 
I was in great shape. I mean, really good shape. Um, he said, I can't believe you're having a heart attack. It doesn't make any sense. But, you know, according to the EKG, I was having a heart attack. So the doctor calls the bridge. Captain's on the bridge because we're in the Mississippi and the, um, the pilot's on board, guiding us all the way down the Mississippi to the open ocean. Tells the captain what's going on, and captain says, well, we got to get him off the ship. So what all goes on there, I don't know. They're basically contacting the authorities in uh, New Orleans, hospital, 911, whatever, and arranging to get me off the ship. You can't just, like, turn around and go back to New Orleans. They had to have a boat come and get me off the ship, and... Uh, that's what they were going to try and do. So I'm in the hospital for like another hour or two. And finally they said, um, the hotel director came down. Hotel director is like, there's captain, staff captain, hotel director. The four stripe officer, he's like my boss's boss. Put it that way. He's my boss's boss's boss, you know. And he came down very concerned about me. Everybody was, because everybody knew me on this ship. I'd done, you know, this is my second contract. So I was very well known on the ship. Had a lot of friends. Um, and he said, okay, the, the rescue boat is here. We need to get you on the boat. So I think I'm just going to put on my shoes and walk there. And he go, no, no, you can't. You're, you're not allowed to walk. You have to get in this uh, gurney. Have you ever seen these um, rescues on TV where they've got this it's um it's not like a stretcher but it's it's shaped like a long basket made out of metal like metal bars you know like a spider's web type thing all metal with the, with the holders all the way around it. it's like seven feet long and uh it's got a pad inside of it like a, a little mini mattress like about that wide and the hotel director i remember ties my shoes for me <laughs> i remember i remember that like the hotel director was tying my shoes. I'd taken my shoes off when they did the EKG. So I, um, I lay down on this thing, and they strapped me in. I just got straps every, like, foot along my whole body. And then uh, on all these ships, they have a medical team, a uh, medical response team. And I used to be as part of it on other ships. And whenever you hear Oscar, 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 uh, no, sorry, not Oscar, that's man overboard. It's a... Uh, um, bright star, on this ship it was bright star, bright star, bright star. When you hear bright star, bright star, that means there's a medical emergency. They'll say, they'll say for example, bright star, bright star, stairway 35, port side. And all the people that are on that medical emergency team that goes through their cab, goes to the whole ship, and they know exactly where to go. And they just take off like lightning and, and fly to that area and deal with whatever the emergency is. I used to be a part of that team on other ships. Um, so these guys all show up, crew members, I know, some officers, some, you know, different departments. They're not in any one department. They're from, from all over the ship. And there's like six guys, big guys, and they lift me up, and then they're holding me like shoulder, shoulder height. And they start taking me out uh, down the I-95, which is the main corridor in the crew area, one deck below deck number, the Mediterranean deck, which is deck, it'd be like deck number one. It's crew only area. It's where the, where the crew bar, well, one of the crew bars is, the crew mess, the crew recreation angel lounge. There's a lot of crew cabins down there. And it's where all the crew go from one of the ship to the other. It's like the highway for the crew. And I'm there, and they're carrying me down the, the I-95. And, of course, all my friends see me. There's Mark, you know, in the stretcher being carried off the ship. What happened to him? Everybody's looking. Everybody's talking. And it's so embarrassing. And they get midship. And they've opened up the side of the ship. If you ever been on a cruise where they put the gangway, there's a watertight door, a great big, huge watertight door that they open up and they, they put the gangway there. They set it up for the tenders to come back and forth. And they'd open up the side of the ship. And so they take me there. And it's dark out. You know, it's dark, Mississippi River. We're not by any um, city or towns or nothing. It's just like forests and stuff in, the, in a muddy bank. And it's dark outside. And I can see, and I'm, I'm strapped in, but I can see, like they got me in the air, you know, and I can see that there's this old rusty boat out there. It's like, like a bar, more like a barge than anything, like a small barge. It's like flat on top. 
And there's three guys there. One of them's smoking a cigarette. Skinny little guy, like maybe 115, 125 pounds. About five foot five. Another guy, looks like he's about 40 years old. Fat, you know, out of shape. And then there's some kids, teenage pimply kid. Looks like he's about 17 or 18. Maybe, maybe not high on meth. Um, and they're going to pass me over to those guys. My big, strong crew member officers who have me securely are going to pass me over. And it's not level. Like from where I am on the ship and where the, the door is open, there's like four or five feet of Mississippi River there, muddy Mississippi River. And there's the, uh, the rescue boat, this old rusty, nasty rescue boat. And these three guys, and they're like maybe three, four feet lower than we're, than the ship. And they start, they're trying to lower me down. So our guys on the ship are totally in control of me. And they start handing me off to these guys. And they're like, and I'm saying, I can walk, I can walk. He said, no, it's okay, you got to stay in there. You must stay in the, in the thing. And they take hold of me. And they're like slipping, barely able to hold me. Like they're going to drop me in the fucking river, you know. And I'm, I'm more scared of that than having a heart attack. And they finally get me onto the, the deck of the boat. And thank God the nurse just realized that, you know, these guys were not, you know, didn't know anything. They weren't like, you know, medical people. And she insisted on going with me. And so they got her on the boat too. And so she's on deck with me. And then they wanted to take me inside of this boat. You know, and they had like this narrow little uh, passageway and stairwell going down to the, some kind of cabin area. And there's no way I was going to fit down there. And I said, look, just leave me out on deck. I'm fine up on deck. There's nothing there. And so I'm out on deck, you know, underneath the stars and stuff. And she's with me, looking after me. And I feel fine, but I'm all strapped in, you know. I hate, I don't like being confined. I mean, I'm a bit claustrophobic when it comes to things like that. So we, uh, this boat separates from the, the ship and starts heading down the Mississippi. And we must have been going for like an hour and we go and we go and we go and finally they pull over to the side of the riverbank and there's this rickety old pier like an old fishing pier but have you ever seen one that's been abandoned like the boards are all gray and rotten and a lot of them are missing and it's a little kiltered it's not straight and the pylons are in the mud and there's weeds and plants and stuff all over you know brush and then there's stairs zigzagging up a very steep hill, maybe a hundred yards up the steep hill to whatever's up there. I don't know, because it's all in the dark. And these guys are supposed to carry me <laughs> up that hill. So first, they're trying to get me off the boat. And this, the nurse is all worried about everything, but there's really nothing more she can do. And she's not coming with me to the hospital. She's just, you know, there to get me. She didn't even realize where they were going to take me. And so she's stuck on the boat. And these th three guys, not four, three guys, are trying to get me first off the boat. One slips and falls. You know, and they drop me. And then they pick me up. They drop me again. And they drop me in the weeds. And they pick me up. And they finally get, you know, control of it. And they're like carrying me, dragging me, dropping me, carrying me, dragging me, dropping me up this zigzag of rickety old wooden stairs in the dark finally to the top of the hill it takes 45 minutes at least and they're all sweaty and panting and I'm surprised one of them didn't have a heart attack we get to the top of the hill and there's an ambulance sitting there waiting again on it's like on a gravel road like a country you know picture back back road country road and there's an ambulance there with two MTs waiting and so they unstrapped me from the gurney, thank God, and helped me into the ambulance. Then they put me on the, uh, the bench inside the ambulance and hooked me all up to an IV and all this stuff. And uh, off we go towards the hospital. And it's like, I didn't know that ambulances don't have shocks in them. There's like no shocks. This, this thing is like, bam, 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 like this real hard real road. And they're asking all these questions, you know, what drugs have you taken? What have you done? You know, and I said, I haven't done anything. 
And uh, it takes like another 45 minutes to get to the hospital. We finally get to the hospital in New Orleans. I can't remember the name of the hospital, but it's like, this is by the way, um, I'm not sure of the date of this, because I'm really bad at remembering dates of when things happened or years, but all I can tell you, this was about a year before Katrina hit New Orleans, okay? So we get to the hospital, they rush me in, put me in a room, and, uh, and then just leave me there. And so about another 30, 40 minutes later, a doctor comes in, a real arrogant prick too, and he starts saying, so what drugs have you taken? I said, I haven't taken any drugs. I, I don't believe you. A guy your age, your shape, you look in great shape, good health, you know, this doesn't happen to normal people, you've taken some drugs. I haven't taken any drugs. I work on a cruise ship, they drug test us, I have to have a physical every year, you know, tested for everything, I have not done any drugs. So, he checks me out some more and says, you know, you've, you've had a heart attack, gives me some more medication, and they check me into intensive care. So I go up into intensive care and I'm in this room by myself, thankfully. And again, they hook all these other monitors. I've got all these monitors all up to me. And I'm in there <clears throat> and I remember looking around and seeing like the floorboards, the, um, what do you call it, the, the sideboards, you know, up against the side of the wall. Um, they're all dirty and dusty. It's a dirty hospital. And the people were just, you know, all the staff was kind of rude and non-attentive. And so I, every like half hour or every few hours they come in and check on you, gave me a little something to eat, asked you for, they said, what's your pain level? I remember asking me that, what's your pain level on one to 10? And my pain level was like two and I said, oh, it's a nine. So I wanted something to help me fucking sleep. So they gave me something, I don't know, Demerol, whatever. And I was able to sleep. And then when I woke up, I needed to take a piss and they didn't give me anything to go. And I'm all, all these wires and shit. And it was, I remember the, the, they had these things stuck to me, like they were glued to my body, but then there was like a patch of like four wires here and they clipped into, you know, a connector here and clipped in, there was like four connections with more wires coming out to this machine. And nobody was coming in to help me, you know, and I needed to go to the bathroom. And like I was, I'm a former stage manager, so I'm used to like, you know, connecting wires and stuff, there are lights and sound and things like that. So I just, I started unconnecting them. I just, oh, it's easy, clip, 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 them. an alarm goes off, bam, 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 bam. And I just go in the bathroom, do my business, come back out, hook myself back up, alarm goes off, nobody came in to check, nobody. So I was there for, <clears throat> I don't know, four or five days. And my father, my wife, I was married at the time, my wife found out, you know, they, the, the uh, Park West called my wife, told her what happened. She told my father what happened. My father flies in all the way from Florida to New Orleans, rents a car, comes to the hospital, he's all worried about me. And he had had quadruple bypass surgery um, about two or three years before that, I remember. And my father was in very good health too. He, he had ridden his bicycle from Florida all the way to um, Kansas City where my brother lived, his 10 speed bike when he was like three years before his heart attack. So that's what kind of shape he was in. So the, the doctor came in, the cardiologist, um, I guess the guy who was gonna be my doctor wasn't available for the first few days I was there, but he came and said, we're gonna give you an angiogram and explain to me what that is. That's where they put a, a catheter in your groin, shoot a dye into your heart, and look at your arteries. So the next day they did that. Came back clean, all your arteries are fine. No clogged arteries, no nothing. Uh, but I can see a scar on your heart. You definitely had a heart attack. Nobody knows why. I'm thinking that maybe I touched something when I was scuba diving, I got some toxin or I don't know what, to this day I have no, no idea what caused it. Nobody was able to explain to me. So, then they, uh, Park West arranged me to be flown home to Utah where I was living at the time. Flew home, was there for 
a couple weeks. And I feel fine, like there's nothing wrong. And I feel absolutely fine, like no side effects, no nothing. And I'm telling Park West, I want to go back on the ship. I'm fine, I can go back on the ship. And the cruise line didn't want to let me back out there, but I was bringing in so much money for them compared to the guy that took over for me. He was back to doing like 15, 20,000 a week, whereas I was doing 180,000. So some people on the, on, at Carnival pulled some levers and twisted some arms and I was able to go back on the ship. And I went back on the ship and uh, everything was fine. Did great, spent another what, four or five months on the ship, everything was wonderful. It's actually less than, I think it was back then I was doing four months on, four months on, two months off. So I was fine, but then about 10 years after that, I was, after I'd gotten divorced and moved, had my own house and everything, I was mowing my lawn in May. First time you ever mow your lawn, the first time the grass comes up. And I had a push mower, a powered push mower all my rich neighbors had, you know, uh, uh, what do they call them? Um, what's the, um, John Deere's. They had the little, fancy little John Deere tractors. I did, did mine by hand. Anyway, I started sweating again. Same symptoms, heart, uh, my shoulders hurting, sweating. And my doctor was only about, you know, two miles away, my family doctor. So I went to see him. He checked me out, said, I think you're fine. But he sent me down to the brand new cardiac hospital in Louisville, Kentucky, which was uh, just opened up. Went in there, there was nobody waiting. They took me right in. EKG was fine, Heart, a chest x-ray, no problem. And they said, we're gonna give you an angiogram just in case. I told him about my father. So the next day I came back, had the angiogram, and my mother drove me there. And I wake up the angiogram and there's all these doctors around me said, we need to take you over to the other hospital right now. Can't go home, can't do anything because you've got four, you're 90% blocked in four arteries. You can't do a stent, can't do anything. If you don't have coronary bypass within the next 24 hours, you're gonna die, period. So they put me in an ambulance, took me to this hospital and I remember I had to share a room with this other guy, African-American guy, and his whole family was in there visiting like all day long. And in order to go to the bathroom, I had to get up and walk past his entire family, like 10 people that were there all day, chatting with him and stuff, to go to the bathroom. You know, your, your ass is hanging out of those gowns. This is a real pain. And then they came and got me around five o'clock in the morning or something, took me down there, and they do all this preparation before you start having surgery. It takes like hours. And then uh, they had me on this gurney and they gave me another shot of Demerol or whatever it was to relax you and you go into this operating room. And if you've ever been in something like this, it's, it's kind of freaky. There's all these people. You know, there, there must have been 10, 15 people in that room. And there's all these instruments and stuff that they're going to use on you. And they... Uh, Put the mask over you, count backward, and you're, you're gone. You're like that, you're out, and you're like that, you're awake. It's so quick, it's really weird. If you ever had general anesthesia, it's a very strange experience because it happens so quick. It's, I was in surgery for, it was like 10, 15 hours, some really long amount of time. And it's just, you're asleep, you're awake, like that. And I, I wake up, and in intensive care, and I've still got the, um, the respirator, the, um, I don't know what you call it, but you had the tube down your, in your lungs, breathing for me, and I'm paralyzed. They've given me this drug to paralyze me, so it's breathing. It's like, I'm a scuba diver. It's very similar to a regulator when you're scuba diving. It sounds like that, except for you're not deciding when you breathe. This thing's deciding for you. And it was very freaky. Um, and I just wanted it out. And I remember finally I was able to move one hand. And I went, and the nurse was watching me and I go, and I take that thing out. She said, oh, another half an hour. So I just kind of tried to relax and stay calm. And eventually half an hour they took it out, moved me to the ICU and you're there. And I had 
a big like it's like a sewing needle or knitting needle in my neck here big tube coming out of me there another tube coming out of me there and of course the IV and stuff I was in intensive care for 10 days then they moved me to the regular ward whatever was in there for a few more days and finally was released and sent home and all I can say is that um, even though I saved my life I'm here today you know over 10 years later feeling great I would never go through it again if I I had a friend of mine that I used to work with when I was selling cars and he had had two bypass surgeries he had one and then like 10 15 years later had to have it all over again I would not do it I mean I've lived a good life if you know they told me you know, sorry, you know, your arteries are all clogged up again or the bypass isn't working again. You need to have it done over, over again. I'd say no. I just, you know, wait till my time is up. It's, some things for me just aren't worth it and that would not be worth it. It's, it's not so much the pain. There was a lot of pain. It was the um, not having control of your body. I don't like it when I'm in a hospital and some nurse can decide to do whatever the fuck they want to you you know, take blood from you, give you an injection, whatever they want to do. It's like you don't, have, you don't have the right to your own body anymore. And I don't like that. I'd rather die. So that's that. So when you guys ask me about the Philippines and if they have good medical care here and stuff, like for heart attacks, things like that, I don't care. I really don't care. I take my blood pressure medicine. I take good care of myself, just like I've always taken good care of myself. And what will happen will happen. We're all, we all die of something. Everybody does. And so, you know, if I die of a heart attack, you know, so be it. Um, but I would not uh, hop on a plane, go back to America, go through that all over again, just to add a couple more years to my life. So that's that story. Uh, not a good story, not a bad story. It's just one of those things that happens to people in life. I'm sure there's many of you out there that have had the same thing happen to you. So... Hope you recovered as well. And uh, again, thanks for watching, guys. Oh, and please, uh, please subscribe to my girlfriend's YouTube channel. Every woman has a story. Uh, you would not believe how excited she gets every time she gets a new subscriber. So really appreciate that. Uh, comments. I try and answer all the comments I can, guys. So uh, write me comments and ask me questions. I answer as many of them as I possibly can. And if you're a troll and you want to insult me or say nasty things, that's fine too. I read those too, you know. But it doesn't affect me. It really doesn't bother me at all. So anyway, guys, have a great day. Thanks for watching. And uh, I'll throw something out there again in the next few days or so. Bye.